Good afternoon. Well, today was worth waiting for. Uh, the Jefferson report, I would say, goes something like this. It's now 56 degrees, a very slight wind, and uh, the sun shines. The zona shined. So it's a, it's a great day. More and more, I hear people talk about their frustration with uh, the courts and the poor decision-making in the face of the outrageous conduct of America's number one criminal, former President Trump. And I share that. I share that same thing. In fact, I have to take many vacations away from the repetitive drone predicting things and reporting on things that are horrendous to behold if you think reasonable people are trying to do their best consistent with the promise of America. Now, for a long time before this happened, particularly in the case of litigation, particularly in the case of defendants in court, I would lecture or say, and I'm sure I've said it in my walk and talks, but it's especially applicable now, is justice is a coincidence of the system, not a consequence of it. In other words, there are rules and there are laws, and we watch them being misapplied or not applied at all. And we have an example of that with Trump, of course. And I'll get into that. And you could ask, what do you do about that? And what I usually tell my clients, and in those difficult cases, not every case uh, prompts the kind of overreach of the system or disregard of an individual's rights, but there are a whole bunch of things that happen that uh, fit into that category. And if you don't have the funds to to retain an attorney, if you're a person of color, if you're a person who is different, if you're a person who is not like the judge's background, male or female, these things do matter, unfortunately. And uh, there's nothing worse, in my opinion, than a politician running for office looking for some crimes to bear down on, unconcerned about the effect on the individual. So, what I try to strive for is when justice is a coincidence, we try to make it what happens in our case. And how do we do that? Well, usually you work hard, and it doesn't mean you succeed. And what you do is you look for alternative ways that other lawyers are not using in a court proceeding to get to the correct place that the law that is being disregarded won't take us. So, and, and you know, there, there are people who are supposed to be liberty's last champions, which is the slogan of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, of which I'm a member and I was on their board years ago and some of the richest uh, times I've had has been with these outstanding lawyers. And one of our phrases is liberty's last champions. And that's the attitude we need for, well, representing anybody in court, but also being concerned about what's happening to the law in our country. Now, I've mentioned before Justice Breyer, and since he's written a book, he's probably going to be on the air for a while. I don't know if he's finished his tour. And I'm, I'm glad that that's the case because Breyer understands the law in a way that six of the members of the court, the cult of sex, six do not. And that's a shame. And uh, Breyer, who's not a person to be impol impolite, if you will, or to stray from his judgment about what he can talk about and when. But he's chosen a couple of things to talk about. And he said that he singled out Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett, half of the cult of six, in my opinion. 
and in part it's because they claim to have this textual uh, analysis of the law. So <laughs> they look at what was happening long before there was a car and medicine and microbes that were recognized. He goes back and tries to, uh, the three of them go back and try to tell us what was meant. And that's fine, but as Breyer says, the law is about more than grammar and punctuation. And we can't all be historians. The law is supposed to put before us the principles that cover this case perfectly or require an extension of reason to decide it does or does not apply. There is a legal method. Lawyers study that. But political types who posture don't follow those things. Now, Breyer stopped short of criticizing the way I may, and in part because he had confidential relations with some of the judges, and he's not a person that goes out there and violates his oath of office. But he has said, certainly in the case of overthrowing Roe v. Wade, that that was an abdication of the judicial role. Because not only did it defy one of the principles of our justice system, going back to England and before that, which is to look at cases before and decide if they're settled precedent and acknowledge that a case that's lasted with power for a long period of time has dealt with a number of differing situations so that it becomes law that is wise, if you will. So what we have with Breyer is that we have to consider a problem from every angle. And one of his questions was, are we interpreting the law so a woman can die because of the way we've twisted the law? I doubt he would have used the word twisted, by the way. So what today makes me think of that analysis? Both my comment that justice is a coincidence and Breyer's notion that without trust, the law has no force. It has to be rational. It has to make sense. It, it, can, it can change, but it has to have a nexus. It has to rely on principles. And we, we all do it. It may be a little more complicated in these cases, but we all do the same thing. And the abortion cases are, I think, rationally easier to consider. Does a woman have a right to be let alone? And I would recommend, if you're unfamiliar with Breyer, you get his current book. I, I haven't looked at it, but I think I can vouch from his prior books that I read that follow the themes that I'm repeating here. So, okay, let's take a case in point, a real case. We have an appellate court in New York that looked at the judgment against Trump requiring him to post something like $500 million to protect the parties from his case being frivolous and then being denied those funds if he were not required to post them. And now that court has done two things. One, it is said instead of the 500 million plus, it'll be 175 million. And it gives him 10 more days to get those funds. And Trump, who received too much airtime, allowing him to give a stump speech attacking every element of the, the so-called justice system, uh, says, oh, he has it and he'll pay it. Well, we've seen this before, right? But let's see if he does it. I think he was 
financially exhausted dealing with the Carroll case, even as he repeats his misconduct, exposing himself to perhaps a revisitation of his misconduct and another judgment and fine against himself. So we have the $175 million judgment. Now, this does not change the judgment that will be at issue on appeal. But, as I understand it, they gave no reasoning for this. They just did it. And you you may see sometimes lawyers write RD, you know, and it's the it's a short form for the rationale of a case. What why does this make sense? So that okay, if we don't agree with the reason, at least we hear the reason. What is the reason? He can't do it. So we give another number that he kind of claims he can't do that either. So I think it's a shame and a disgrace that a court reaches out and puts a man like this, for whom we owe no empathy, for whom we owe no gratitude, for whom we have only charges, criminal charges, misconduct, demeanor, unethical behavior, boorish behavior. I don't must say like a pig in the mud, but I hate to slander my own my own animals. Our pugs are pigs are pretty cute. You know, you'd have to see them. <laughs> Someday when we bring everybody out here to walk with me, we'll visit the pigs. You can feed them with pumpkins and things. So there's that. Now, the other thing that happened today is spot on and true New York in the sense that I think, you know, the the thing about if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. The foundation for that is that it can be a very tough city, but we've had the mark of Trump for a long time, those of us who lived there and watched him acclimate to an ever more diabolical and self-aggrandizing way over the years. So, and then attacking a judge, not that I, I can be critical of courts, but I think there's a way to do it. And uh, it's not always intended when a judge makes an error any more than when you or I make an error. So, but we have Trump in court trying to accuse prosecutor D.A. Bragg of misconduct because they only just got documents. But these characters waited until January to file a subpoena to get these documents. So who's at fault there? And a year or more earlier, Bragg asked for these documents and what he got, he turned over. And now they've analyzed them and they say there's about 200 or 300 documents. In other words, it's a digestible amount of information you can consider to use or not use at the trial for prosecution or defense. So as a result of a judge who has lived this case already, who is steeped in the experience of difficult cases in Manhattan, uh, the trial is set for April the 15th, which is ironic and amusing in a way since Trump has spent so much time ducking his responsibilities, although this case is a hush money case. So it'll be Cohen and Stormy Daniels and lots of documents, and it may take six weeks. And at the end of it, I'd be very surprised if he wasn't convicted, and I'd be very surprised if there wasn't custody in the sentence. So how about that? The... uh, a couple of stray things interest me because Holly and I try to be careful about getting infections, particularly because she's immunosuppressed. And if I have it and bring it into the house, that's not very good either. So, um, But this guy got on a plane and he refused. He wanted 
the guy who was sitting next to him had a mask to move, and he didn't want to sit there, and he wanted to sit someplace else. And uh, so they threw him off the plane. And his, uh, it's Forey Smith. Uh, I have no idea what he's like, because I have never seen him. But this is the kind of stupid, selfish, arbitrary way to approach social health care that can hurt and even kill some people. So I'm glad he was thrown off the plane and not literally, but <laughs> please, sir, would you get the hell out of here? <laughs> and he got drunk wherever he was because he couldn't get a, a plane after that. Perfect. There's one other matter that is more significant than this dolt on the plane, and that is that the UN has uh, supported a resolution of a ceasefire during Ramadan, provided that the hostages be released. Now, the United States is one of five member nation, nation states that has a veto, and uh, they have exercised the veto, but this time they did not. They did not support the resolution, the other 14 states did, but uh, they abstained, so they acted by not acting. <laughs> and Israel doesn't want to talk to us anymore, which is just fine for Israel. And you can't say it's your war when you're using our money and putting our nation at risk in various ways. And I, I don't propose it's a simple solution when people have such heightened hate and bloodthirsty objectives. But we have to work through that. And uh, we doubled down that we support Israel, but we're not unthinking. And uh, Netanyahu is very upset about that. So, uh, that's what I got today. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm copacetic, I suppose, because I've uh, spent the day writing papers in a legal case. And I have to file in a week or so. And uh, uh, people have asked me, uh, do I enjoy the law? And that's not exactly the right word, but what I... I do enjoy helping people I care about in matters that are complicated enough that it takes coffee and hard thinking to figure out what's the best way to handle a particular dispute. So I've been doing that. And I'll be doing that when I finish this walk. <laughs> but for now, I say goodbye to you guys out there and gals from the Cathedral of Trees. All the best. Bye-bye.